to the family. Hadn't preached a sermon to the family in many years. Every daddy needs to be here tomorrow night. Every granddaddy needs to be here. Be here. Every young man. Tomorrow night, uh, uh, we're having our futures night, our student night. What a great night for us to have a message like that. The invitation is going to be real special. Can't describe how the service is going to end tomorrow night. So uh, it's a great night. If you've got a prodigal, maybe a family member that's wayward, please come. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to look at what God says about the Christian home uh, tomorrow night. And let's come and pack the building. Uh, we're almost completely full tonight. Uh, let's just pack it tomorrow night as we look at the family. Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, and go with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. And I'm preaching tonight on this subject, you're in the right place for a miracle. You're in the right place for a miracle. From the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God? Everybody standing. I'm in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 10. The ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and I'll begin reading in verse 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get victuals or food provision. For we are here in a desert place. And he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to the disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled. I'm going to read that line one more time. And they did eat and were all filled. And there was taken up of fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. I'm preaching tonight on one of the most astounding miracles in the whole book. I'm preaching on this subject, you're in the right place for a miracle. You're in the right place for a miracle. Thank God for his word and the perfection of it. Please be seated. Let's pray together all over the building, every head bowed, every eye closed. My God, I thank you for this great music. God, I thank you for Brother Michael. God, thank you for the anointing that's upon his ministry. And God, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to worship you tonight. And now, God, I ask for your unction for your anointing, for your fire. God, would you loose me and let me go? God, would you come against my enemy that we tell tonight he is a liar and he's a loser and he's welcome nowhere in this house. God, would you do the preaching right now? And God, will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. In Acts 2.22, the Bible says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is a man of miracles. I believe in miracles. I love the story of the six-year-old boy that got out of Sunday school one day, saw his daddy in the hallway at church, and excited, he ran as fast as he could up to his daddy, screaming to the top of his lungs, whoa, dad, said, I just heard the most awesome Bible story ever. It was about Moses and the people of Israel crossing the Red Sea. His dad was so proud. He said, big man, tell me all about it. Little guy said, dad, it was awesome. Pharaoh's terrorist army had the people trapped against the sea. They were dead meat, Dad. And old Mo whipped out a cell phone, got him a satellite link up, and he called the Israeli Air Force, and they brought their F-16s in and just bombed them. And then he called the Israeli Army, and they brought their M-2 missile tanks, and they came in and ran over the rest of them. And then, Dad, the Israeli Navy showed up while all that was going on and blew up huge pontoon bridges, and all the people walked across the Red Sea. His daddy looked at him and said, son, did your teacher really tell you that's how they crossed the Red Sea? The little boy frowned and said, no, dad, but if I told you what she said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> now, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, I've read the story and I believe it. And the reason I believe it is because I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible because I believe in the one who wrote the Bible. And the one that wrote the Bible is a miracle maker. And when the miracle maker walked this earth, a whole parade of miracles followed after him. 
I mean, the miracles of Jesus are astounding. Jesus Christ told violent storms to shut up. He told crippled men to get up. He told deaf ears to listen up. Told blind eyes to look up. Told dead bodies to rise up. All in all, when you read the first four books of the New Testament, there are 37 recorded miracles of the Lord Jesus. But the miracle I'm preaching about tonight, teenagers, has been called his well-known miracle, the most famous miracle. A lot of people call this miracle his most well-known miracle because, listen, it is the only miracle. I'm going to say that again. It's the only miracle outside of his own resurrection. It's the only miracle that appears in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the only miracle that appears in all four of the Gospels. So this is a monster miracle. It's a monumental miracle. It's a massive miracle. Hey, let me set the stage, all right? When the story begins, Jesus' very close friend, John the Baptist, has just died. He's been beheaded. He's been executed. Jesus is heartbroken. So the Lord Jesus takes his 12 disciples, and they're going out into a desert place to grieve and be alone. Well, when Jesus Christ got near any town or any village or any country, anywhere, word got out. They didn't have social media, didn't have Facebook, but folk found out. And buddy, when Jesus and his disciples start treading along the eastern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, here they come, man. I mean, they begin to flock out of the hills and the houses and the towns and the villages. Fifty, a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, another thousand, another thousand. Matter of fact, Luke specifies how many showed up. Look what he says in the 14th verse of the ninth chapter. Dr. Luke says, for there were about 5,000 men. Now, that's very significant. If you're noting in your Bible, men, men. Because, ladies, it's not a put-down, but in Bible days, the families were numbered by the head of the family. So Luke is specific to say 500 men. Scholars believe there might have been 25,000 people on that hillside. Because, see, where there are men, there are women. And where there are men and women, there are children. There could have been 25,000 people there that day. Most theologians agree it was the largest crowd that ever showed up in one place at one time to hear the Lord Jesus. And boy, what a story. I mean, it gets good. There they all are, that huge mob, but then all of a sudden it gets bad because the sun is setting, the evening's coming, and their stomachs are beginning to growl, and there's no drive through in the desert. There's not a Zaxby's anywhere in sight. And those people are getting hungry, and now they're wondering how they're going to feed them all. And the disciples scour around the crowd, and all they could find was one little boy with five little crackers and two sardines. And that's all it was. I'll tell you that in a moment. That's all it was. What those folks didn't understand was they were in the right place for a miracle. And I want you to know Jesus Christ took that basket of food, that bread became a buffet, those sardines became a seafood supper, and every one of those folks got fed. It was a miracle. Now, let me give you the good news. The one that performed that miracle is in this building tonight. He's in this place. And see, you're in the right place for a miracle. You say, oh, Rick, I'm not starving. Oh, you may not be starving and you're struggling, you're in the right place for a miracle. Son, you may not be hungry, but you're hurting. You're in the right place for a miracle. You may not need a piece of physical bread, but you're lost without Jesus, and you need the living bread, and you need a miracle tonight. Here's how you know you need a miracle. I guarantee you somebody in this building needs a miracle. I want you to know there are three instances in which somebody in this house needs a miracle, and son, it's going to get real good. Somebody here needs a miracle when the situation is hopeless. I'm going to say that one more time. When the situation is hopeless, look what it says in verse 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him and all, they told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert or a solitary place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. Now look at the first line of verse 11. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. That, that word followed is a strong Greek word. Literally, it means reached out to him. They reached out to him because many were there facing an emergency. Anybody had an emergency lately? Judy and I had an emergency on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we're getting ready to go to our church that night for our Lord's Supper service. I love that service. And, of course, I'm home. It's the holidays. And we have, I had come in. Our kids and grandkids are coming the next day to the house. And, and I went to the refrigerator to get a drink. And I noticed our refrigerator that's only three years old is not working. Now, this is 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Christmas Eve. And we had ham in there. We had turkey in there. We had holiday food in there. We had all the kids and grandkids coming. I mean, that's a little bit of an emergency. And so, son, I jumped in my car, and I started to run down to the River City area to try to— I, I intended to get one of them little four-foot refrigerators. 
you know, to put a little bit of food in so we wouldn't have to just live out of an ice chest or two or three ice chests for, for Christmas in the yard because the repairman couldn't get there until after Christmas. Well, some, I'm just driving. The first place I came to was Walmart. Have you ever been to Walmart at 2 o'clock on Christmas Eve? <laughs> Folks, I did not get out of my car. There was not a place to park. But I guarantee you nobody was singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. I'm going to tell you that right now. I made my way over to Lowe's, and I walked in Lowe's, and it was just bedlam, people everywhere. And there was this guy that worked at Lowe's standing there next to a big old three-letter sign that said, Joy. And I walked over to that guy, and I said, I've got a Christmas emergency. And that guy said, you and everybody else. And he had two or three people around him, and I thought, that guy's not saying ho, ho, ho. And I walked away from him, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I walked back to the refrigerator section, and there was a woman standing there that worked at Lowe's. And I said to her, I've got a Christmas emergency. Now, there were two or three people standing around. I did not get in front of them. But immediately, she started to talk to me. She said, well, let's see what we can do. And as we began to talk, I told her I was a preacher. And when I told her I was a preacher, she got all pumped up. I mean, she was excited, man, because she was a believer. And she said, well, you don't want one of them little four-foot refrigerators. She said, look here, preacher. Right there on the showroom floor was an 18 foot cubic, 18 cubic foot refrigerator that had been dented out of the box. And it was already greatly reduced. And she knocked 300 more dollars off that. Folks, it costs less than one of them four-foot refrigerators. Now we got one for the garage, man. And I'm telling you, I said, I want that. Before I knew it, I went to rent the Lowe's truck to get back home, and she had put it on a dolly. Folks, this is a little embarrassing, but she walked up there in front. There was like 10 people in line. She put me in the front of the line. And I didn't look at nobody behind me at all because I know they weren't saying peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I'll tell you. But that woman, before she left, said this, Preacher, there ain't no emergencies with Jesus. And I thought about that later when I got to our church's Lord's Supper service. You know, Judy and I had finally calmed down from the hectic afternoon, and I thought all I had was a broken refrigerator. That was my emergency. And Brother Michael, I realized when I preached this message tonight, somebody's got a lot more emergency than a broken refrigerator. Somebody here's got a broken heart. Somebody here's got a broken home. Somebody here's got broken hope. There's somebody here that needs a miracle. Your situation is hopeless. That was this bunch that came that day to the desert. For instance, look what it says in verse number 12. What a descriptive verse. And when the day began to wear away, that means to be spent. Anybody, anybody, be, anybody spent tonight? When the day began to wear away, what a picture. Then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitudes away, that they may go to the towns and country round about and lodges and get some victuals or food, for we are here in a desert place. Would you look at that word desert? Y'all know what the word desert means? The word desert means a desolate place. The word desert means a dry place. You ever been in the desert? First time Judy and I went to Israel, we'd only been married about a year. Went to Israel for the first time and went way down south in a little town called Elat, right on the Red Sea. I mean, it was a long drive. I hadn't been back. It just takes a whole day to get there. And we went down to Elat, and that night before dinner, we got there early. I left. I was in my 20s then, so I felt, you know, froggy. I could do this stuff. Right behind our beautiful hotel, there was this magnificent mountain, a rocky mountain that led into the desert. On the other side of the mountain was the Red Sea. And I decided, I'm going to climb that mountain. So like a dummy, I climbed that mountain, got over the top, looked at the Red Sea, waved my arms at the Red Sea. Then I went down and looked at the Red Sea, and I miscalculated the time. And before I knew it, the sun, which was setting, was setting quickly. And I turned, and I got so discombobulated with that dark mountain and that dark night. I tried to climb back up that mountain. I had no clue where I was. I slipped, fell, cut my knee. And I'm about to cry thinking I'm never going to see my new wife again. And the second thing I thought was, Brother Michael, I can see the headlines now. Body of tourists found 200 yards from four-star resort. I mean, I, there, I was just over the mountain, but I was lost. And every time I read the word desert in the Bible, I think about that day. And see, there's some of you here right now, you're in the desert. And there's nothing adventurous about it. And don't you sit there and say, well, Brother Rick, I'm not in a desolate place. I'm in a church full of people. I got news for you, buddy. You can be in a crowded church and be in the desert. You can be surrounded by friends and be in the desert. You can be in the arms of family and be in the desert. How did you get to the desert? I mean, you got there quick, didn't you? Some of you got to the desert with a doctor's report. Some of you got to the desert when somebody said, I don't love you anymore. Some of you got to the desert when you woke up without a job. 
Some of you got to the desert as your physical body began to break down. See, fractured families put us in the desert. Shattered securities put us in the desert. Broken bodies put us in the desert. And I've come to remind everybody what you already know. When you're in the desert, the devil reminds you that you're in the desert. He wants you to know you're in the desert. You need relief because you're stranded in the desert. But I've come to remind you something else. I've come to remind you what the devil's not going to remind you. The devil knows you're in the desert, but somebody else knows you're in the desert too. And he's in the desert with you, son. May I remind you what the Word of God said when Moses got ready to face Pharaoh, march into Pharaoh's court, and demand the release of God's people before the most powerful man in the land? In Exodus 1-2, God Almighty said, you tell Pharaoh, I am with you. Whenever Jacob got ready to take over the nation of Israel, in Joshua chapter 1, remember what he said to Joshua? He said, do not be dismayed wherever you go, I am with you. In the book of Judges, when Gideon took 300 men to face multiplied thousands God said don't sweat it Gideon that's paraphrase don't sweat it Gideon you will not die I am with you remember what he told David in Psalm 23 even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death I am with you remember what he told his disciples in John 14 18 when you when I leave I do not leave you for I will not leave you comfortless I will always be with you can I just encourage somebody tonight Jesus is in the house can I remind you that Jesus Jesus is the shelter in your day of trouble. Jesus is the bridge over your raging water. Jesus is the anchor in your stormy sea. Jesus is your fourth man in the fiery furnace. Jesus is your strong tower over the enemy. Jesus is your soothing wind in the blistering desert. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. And there are some of you here saying right now, Rick, I'm in the middle of the desert, but I got good news. You're in the right place for a miracle, man. Can I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that you're in a situation that's hopeless when you're in a desert place. But I'm not finished. Go and get real good now. Because, son, some of you are in the desert place, but some of you are in the doubting place. Now, buddy, I want you to walk through something that's real right here. Some of your situation's hopeless because you're full of doubt. Look what the Bible says in verse 12. And when the day began to wear away, there came un then came the twelve, excuse me, and said to him, send the multitudes away. So they can go get food. Jesus is getting a little advice from the boys. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. They just going to help Jesus. So Jesus now going to get a little advice from the guys. Y'all know what I'm talking about? My little five-year-old granddaughter gave me some advice at Christmas. Uh, every year, Judy and I take the grandkids and their parents somewhere. Usually it's Disney World or the beach. Last year, we took them to Noah's Ark. Well, my little five-year-old granddaughter has been on this six-month kick, and she's serious about it, that I'm taking them to Hawaii. And she said, Granddaddy's taking us to Hawaii. And she said that at Christmas. And I said, Baby doll, I said, going to the beach is a lot different going to Hawaii. Going to Noah's Ark is different going to Hawaii. I said, it costs a lot of money to go to Hawaii. Where's Granddaddy going to get the money to take you to Hawaii? Here's what she said. Well, you need to just sell more books. So every one of those books back there are $100 a piece, and you can get five for $400, man. That little girl gave me some advice. Now, boys, you better get a hold of this. This is good. They're giving Jesus some advice, and if you'll put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together, it's hilarious. Matthew 14, 15, those boys basically said, he's preached too long. In Luke 6, 35, they said, Jesus, don't you know we're in the desert? In John chapter 6, verse 7, Philip said, Jesus, it's going to take eight months' wages to feed this bunch. When you put all that together, they're already walking in all that doubt. And now can you imagine that committee meeting? Oh, come on, son. The disciples get together, and i got a picture, Michael. They're having a committee meeting. Oh, come on. And they're deciding a spokesman to go tell Jesus they're in a mess. And they're deciding what they're going to do. Can, can I remind you something? They're not only telling Jesus they got a problem, they're telling him how to fix the problem. Don't you look at me like you've never done that. God, I'm in trouble, and this is what I want you to do to fix it. That's exactly, all of us do that. Well, buddy, here they are talking. Now, come on, Baptist, you can imagine. I mean, they're talking, and one of them says, guys, we've already missed the first game. I mean, we've been out here all day. We're fixing to miss the second game. And, and guys... He's preached a long time. A lot. Somebody needs to go tell him 
that this crowd's hungry. Let's tell him the people are hungry because he loves the people. So let's tell him that. I don't know who the spokesman was. I got an idea it was probably Peter. I don't know. And can you imagine the spokesman walking over to Jesus? Lord, now this has been real good. We've all enjoyed it. This whole series you've done in one day. I mean, we've all enjoyed this preaching. And Jesus, we could stay all, we could stay all night. This ain't about us. All of us could stay all night and hear you. We love you, Jesus. We say you're the greatest preacher. We thought John the Baptist was good. Oh, but you're good. And we could stay all night. We're going to get the CD. This is one great service. But Jesus, it's time for them to go home. You need to shut this thing down. It's time to send these people away. And you know what Jesus did? I love this. Jesus just puts it right back in their face. Look at verse 13. And he said unto them, give ye them to eat. Now, in the Greek language, that's emphatic. Unless you think I'm being dramatic, here's what Jesus said. Hey, dinner's on them. <laughs> he said, hey, boys, if they're hungry, you guys give them something to eat. Y'all do it. And here's what they did, son. This is so me, so you don't act like it's not. They began to filter through the crowd until they found a little boy with fish and bread, and that wasn't near enough to feed 25,000 people. Because God's reminding us in this scripture, our plans are not enough, and our answers are not enough. And if you don't get nothing else, you better get this, because this is amazing the situation is hopeless. It is humanly impossible to feed that many people with that little bit of food. But they're running around telling Jesus what to do. And Brother Michael, it hit me one day. What they're forgetting is Jesus Christ is standing there. Now, all you've got to do is go through your Bible, son, and it'll blow your mind what Jesus has already done up until this event. They've already watched Jesus turn the water to wine. They've already watched Jesus put clean flesh on rotting leprosy. They've already watched Jesus break up a funeral and raise a 12-year-old girl from the dead. They've already watched Jesus where a terminally ill woman touched the hem of his garment in the streets and she was instantly well. They've already watched Jesus cast thousands of demons out of one man and yet they're wringing their hands saying, what in the world are we going to do? And don't act like that's not us. Because we do the same thing. My wife is on the front row, and she'll love this part of the sermon because I'm telling the truth and nothing but the truth. In 31 years on the road as an evangelist, there's one thing, Brother Michael, that has warned me, and there's one thing that has torn me up, and there's one thing that makes me feel like I'm spent, and it's the finances. For 31 years, over and over and over, when the finances are low and we can't seem to meet the budget, I get frantic. All I want is the budget met. And I'm now old enough. I don't know how many more years I'm going to preach 40-something revivals a year. And the devil's reminding me, you're going to wear out. And how in the world are you going to pay the bills? And I'm still pretty healthy, son. I ain't got no hair, but I'm pretty healthy. I'm going to tell you that right now. How in the world are y'all going to pay the bills? And Judy will testify, Michael, I have fretted about that, though I have seen my God since the beginning. Our first year in evangelism, a woman who was very poverty-ridden put $1,000 in our mailbox that got us through a time and stretch of bills that we really needed it. A little later in the early 90s, a church robbed part of a love offering from me, and I found out about it. And a man on the front steps of that church gave me a $300 check to make up for what that church had taken because he knew it. Our ministry was in trouble at the end of last year. We went through last year the most difficult financial year we've gone through in 20 years. 20, I don't know why, but we did. But at the end of the year, a man wrote our ministry a check, and he said he did it to obey the Holy Ghost, that God told him to do it, didn't ask for it, didn't call him, he just wrote it. So what I'm trying to say is my wife's on the front row, and she will do this. Every time that need is met, she'll say something cute like, oh, ye yeah, of little faith. But the worst thing she says is, see there, see there. And I'm thinking if she's saying that stuff, what is God Almighty saying, man? But y'all are the same way. He's fed you he's provided for you he's cared for you he's met every need he's never going to let you down but when we get in the desert the first thing we do is get filled with doubt you're in the desert place 
You're full of doubt. I got good news. You're in the right place for a miracle. The situation's hopeless. I'm not finished. Don't get real good now. Oh, I love this miracle. I'll tell you when you need a miracle. You need a miracle when the situation is hopeless. Number two, you're in the right place for a miracle. Check this out now. When you surrender it all to him. I'll say that again. When you surrender it all to him. Look at verse 13. I'm still in Luke 9. The Bible says in verse 13, boy, this is good. The Bible says in verse 13, and he said to them, give ye them to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes. Except what in the world are we going to do? Because we need to go send them to buy meat because that's not enough to feed this multitude and this crowd. Now, folks, they specifically said we found two fishes and five loaves. Put your index finger there. You knew I had to turn here. John's a little more specific than that. Go over to the Gospel of John chapter 6, and I'm coming right back. Go to John 6. John is the only one that, this, that is this specific. In the sixth chapter of John, John says this about the five loaves and two fishes. Everybody knows the story. But in the sixth chapter, John says this in verse 9. There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? I mean, even Andrew flunked the test. He, he found the boy, but he said, that's not enough. Now, John is specific. John says it's a lad. John's the only one of the four Gospels that said it's a boy. Only one that says it's a child. Nobody else specifies that. John does. The word lad there means a child or a small boy. We need faith like our children. I had an accident at the beach last summer on my boogie board. Oh, I like to ride them boogie boards, man. I didn't say surfboard. I'm not out of my mind. I said boogie board. You know those boards you put right there and you run back? I can ride them waves now. I got me an orange boogie board teenager. It's called the Slick Lizard. And I was riding my boogie board, and my son found a sandbar, and it was only about that deep, son. And that day in the Atlantic, I loved the Atlantic. Those waves were about four feet high, and I was riding them, boys. And our granddaughters were out there playing on the edge of the sandbar, Michael, and I caught one of those, and I don't know exactly what happened, but that wave, the power, that I mean, when that, those waves were crashing, it was thunder. That wave threw me down into the Atlantic. I'm telling you, son, I hit the bottom with force. It was like that thing picked me up and wham, threw me down. I mean, I lost my hat. I lost my hair. I lost my boogie board. I mean, son, I'm thankful I didn't break my neck. I heard a crack. My ears were ringing. And I can't, folks, I scraped on that shell at the bottom. I kid you not. I came up, blood's pouring off my head. And you can ask Judy, I'm not being sensational. Pouring, pouring off my head, the bridge of my nose, under my nose, my cheek looked like I'd been in a martial arts fight, man. And I come out of the water. My grandkids thought I'd been attacked by a shark, man. So we got out of the water. We thought we'd have to go to the hospital. Judy got all the bleeding stopped. But it was precious, Michael. We got up in that condo room, and them four little granddaughters started writing me little get well cards. And I'm on the couch milking it for all it's worth. And then my little six-year-old Brooklyn, Brian and Rachel's little girl, little Brooklyn came over while the rest of them were eating preacher just as innocent as she could. And she laid her hand on my shoulder and she said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. <laughs> and you know why that blessed me? Because that little girl believed it. The faith of a child, a little boy with one little basket of food. Now, this is good. Let me tell you when to get a miracle. You get a miracle when you surrender it to him. And what does it mean to surrender to him? First of all, let him take what you have. I'm going to say that again. Let him take what you have. Now watch this. Watch this. Look at verse 9. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two. John's the only one that specifies this. Small fishes. John's the only one of the four gospels that calls the loaves barley and the only one that calls the fishes small. He's the only one. That's very significant. So he says the barley and the small fishes. Teenagers, y'all know why that's significant? Barley was the cheapest grain of the day. Poor people ate barley. Barley was animal food. This was a poor little boy, a slave little boy. Had animal food. It was nothing more than little crackers, little wafers, little biscuits, scholars say. And that's why I say sardines, because the two small fish were pickled for preservation. They were about the size of sardines or anchovies. He barely had enough to fold over in a napkin. John is specific to tell us how small the basket is for 25,000 people. And let me tell you what that means. That means little is much when God is in it, son. Let me ask you a personal question. What y'all got in your basket? 
How much you got in your basket? Hey, who's the victory in the Christian life? So he says, oh, Rick, I don't have much in my basket. Are you kidding me? God don't need much. I mean, God took a little basket from a little woman named Jochebed who put a little baby in a basket, and God used that little baby to deliver a whole nation. God don't need much. God took a little jawbone of a dead donkey, put it in the hand of Samson, and killed an entire army. God don't need much. God took a little stone in the slingshot of a little boy to drop a giant because God don't need much. God took two little widow's mites and an offering plate to remind us all a lesson for giving because God don't need much. And God took a little baby in a manger to save the world. Little is much when God is in it. What you got in your basket? Don't insult God by saying, I don't have much in my basket, Rick. Are you kidding me? God took a killer named Saul and transformed him, transformed him into the greatest Christian of the New Testament named Paul. God took a stammering, stuttering, backwoods shoe clerk named D.L. Moody and used him to rock two continents. God took a shy, introverted, backward dairy farm boy in North Carolina and used him to evangelize the world. His name is Billy Graham. Can I remind everybody at Black Rock and every other church? Great churches are made up of little things. It's that woman that sits in the nursery whose kids are grown. But she sits in the nursery and takes care of other children so some young mother can hear the Word of God. It's that patient preschool worker that feels like screaming because the kids have too much chocolate or too much sugar and they're climbing walls. But with great patience, she puts her arm around that kid to read him his Bible story. Uh, Brother Bill, it's that, it's that student worker volunteer that goes on vacation to take a bunch of students to student camp. And some adult man sits in a room with 10 snoring boys that are snoring in different languages. And they do that because they're giving what they've got. Folks, don't you dare insult God and say, I don't have the voice to sing a solo. No, but you got a voice to sing in the choir. You may not be able to preach, but you can pray for your preacher. You may not be able to teach, but you can support your class. You may not be able to give a fortune, but you can be a storehouse tither. You may not be able to cook, but you can stack tables and fold chairs. You may not be able to do everything, but you can do something. What's in your basket? What's in your basket? You got to let him take what you have. I don't know what's in your basket. Some of you got trouble in your basket. Give it to him. Some of you got talent in your basket. Give it to him. Some of you got problems in your basket. Give it to him. Some of you got potential in your basket. Give it to him. Now check this out because it's real good. Don't miss this one. First of all, you got to let him take what you have. Are you listening? Then second, you got to let him transform what you have. First he takes it, and then he transforms it, and this is so good. Go back over to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, and I'm rounding third now. This is good. Look at Luke chapter 9. I love this. Look what it says in verse 14. For there were about 5,000 men, and he said to his disciples, make them sit down by 50s in a company. And they did so and made them all sit down. Now I want everybody to stop for a second. That's a miracle right there. Man, I'm going to I, I, cut the disciples a little slack here. You ever try to work with people? They got 25,000 people. And they put, here's what they did. There were aisles. That's what it meant, sit them in companies. In other words, there were aisles and rows that so organized. Jesus said, here's what you can do, boys. I want you to divide them, sit them in companies, and there were aisles and there were rows. And now watch this. I'll get to the miracle of the last point. But now he takes the little boy's basket. Don't miss this. First he takes it, and then he transforms it. But he can't transform it till he takes it. I believe I'll say that one more time. Yeah. He can't transform it till he takes it. Understand? It was transferred to Jesus, but this is so good, you ought to write this down. That which is transferred to Christ is transformed by Christ. But he can't transform it until it's transferred. My God can do everything. But he will not do anything until we give him everything. Here it is, Jesus. Here it is. First, he's got to take it. Then he transforms it. But you've got to surrender it to him. Over a hundred years ago, a little girl wearing rags and unkempt hair, a child, stood out in front of a Baptist church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was crying. The young pastor of that church walked down the steps and saw her crying and said, what's wrong, honey? She said, I want to go to Sunday school. 
but a woman told me I wasn't dressed good enough to go to Sunday school. He said, you are. He took that baby girl by the hand, walked her to Sunday school. Within a year, that girl was saved. She kept coming to Sunday school. Another year later, two years after the pastor met her, she had a horrible disease during a terrible winter, and she died. And that pastor came to that little tenement house, and the mother thanked the pastor for what he'd done for his girl and handed the pastor a little purse, a little rumpled purse that the girl had gotten out of a garbage can. He said, Preacher, her last words were to give this to you. The pastor opened it up, and there was a note, and it said, Take this money so the church can grow and get more kids in Sunday school. And there was 57 cents. She had saved in two years 57 cents. And that pastor became so moved, that church was trying to relocate. They were beginning to grow. And he went back before the congregation and held up that 57 cent in that purse and said, this is our beginning. This is what we're going to use to buy property and build a church. And it got on the news wires. And folks began to give and get excited about it. Within two years, folks gave $250,000, an unheard of sum in that day to that church. And the ministry of that church and a realtor heard about the 57 cent and donated property worth thousands of dollars. Today, if you go to Philadelphia, look up the Temple Baptist Church. It's a church that seats 3,000 people, sits on that property preaching the Word of God. Right next to it is the Good Samaritan Hospital sitting on that property that helps little boys and girls. And folks, here's what happened. All that began with 57 cents. You know why? Because little is much when God is in it. Amen. I'm going to wrap this thing up now. It's going to get good now. We're going to have a miracle. Here we go. You're in the right place for a miracle when your situation's hopeless. You're in the right place for a miracle when you surrender it to him. But number three, you're in the right place for a miracle when the Savior's in the house. And here we go now. Watch this. Verse 16, then he took. Y'all ready for this? That word took in the Greek language literally means to get a hold of. Son, you let Jesus get a hold of something, it's never the same. You let him get a hold of your ministry. Let him get a hold of your marriage. Let him get a hold of your church. Let him get a hold of your heart. The Bible said he took a hold of it. Now, here we go, son. Watch this. He took a hold of it, the five loaves and two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. Because when the Savior's in the house, two things are in the house, and I'm done. Number one, there's a miracle in the house. And Brother Michael... I wondered about this miracle. Reckon how he did it. I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'm not adding the Word of God. Oh, come on, son. He could have spoke to heaven and poof, a basket would have appeared in everybody's lap. Oh, come on. But that's not how he did it. He put it in the hands of the disciples, the ones who had doubted. And the Bible said he gave it to the disciples and they sent before the people. Here's what I believe they did. Here's what I believe they did. Brother John, I believe they began to carry that bread around. Here, take a piece of bread. 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 Brother John, you took too much. Take a piece, take a piece of bread. Take a piece of bread. And I, I believe those disciples, take a piece of bread. Boy, you took more than he did. I believe he took that bread around and handed it out like this, and I believe that bread just kept growing in their hands. That's what I believe. Wouldn't you love to have seen that, man? I mean, they're taking, and by the way, can I throw this in for no charge? This just hit me today. The miracle was not from or made in the hands of the master. It was made in the hands of the disciples. They got to get in on it. Are you listening to me? Because when you're walking with a master, God uses your hands to reach out to somebody else. Whoa, that's good, man. And it's a miracle. And they began to pass the bread and pass the bread. And the bread just kept growing. And the fish just kept growing. It was a miracle. You know, this has been one of the most disputed miracles in the Bible. It, it has been. In the 20th century, some guy at a seminary said, that this was really a miracle of human kindness. That everybody in 20,000 people or more had to have a little bit of food and a knapsack or something. So when the little boy gave, they got convicted to start sharing, and pretty soon there was enough food. In the 1930s, in a liberal seminary in America, this was said about this miracle. This is the truth. Not the truth, but this is what was said. I'm telling you the truth. A guy said the disciples set it all up. They knew the crowd was coming, and so they'd been storing food in caves for months. And yet scholars say it would take 15 tons of food to feed that bigger crowd. But they'd been saving for months, and Jesus backed up to the cave. And when he put his arms like this, they just handed it underneath the sleeves of his robe. And it was hocus pocus. Are you out of your mind? 
it's a whole lot easier to believe it was a miracle. Amen. Because that's what happened. It was a miracle. There's a miracle in the house. And I tell you something, I'm done. When the Savior's in the house, there's a meal in the house. For the Bible says in verse 17, and they did eat and were all filled, and that means satisfied. And they were taking up fragments that remained 12 baskets. Every one of the disciples got a doggy bag. They didn't deserve it, but they got one. Aren't you glad God puts up with us? Can I get a witness? Somebody said, my God is so great, it's amazing that he's God, that he gets done what he gets done with, what he's got to work with. Present company here included. They got a meal, Brother John. Look at me before we bow our heads. They got a meal. See, Jesus used this as an object lesson. He never performed a miracle without a purpose. And the object lesson, don't turn to it, it's found in John 6, 35, where Jesus, after the miracle, said, boys, I'm the bread of life. He that eats of this bread will never hunger. Look at me. Somebody in this wonderful crowd tonight is hungry. That's why you've been trying to, student, that's why you try everything in the world. It's like a fast food place, and you drive down the interstate, and you know, I'm not going to stop there. I'm not going to stop there. You finally find a place you think will satisfy you. And that's what people do. That's why folks are lost, because they're constantly trying to satisfy the hunger. And the reason it never gets satisfied, they're not eating in the right place. And some of you here tonight are lost, and you're going to die without God and go to hell. And your whole life, you're going to be hungry because that quench. And that thirst and that hunger has never been satisfied. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. I've come to tell you when the situation's hopeless, you're in the right place for a miracle. When you're ready to surrender it to him, you're in the right place for a miracle. When the Savior's in the house, you're in the right place for a miracle. In a state not too far from here, a pastor I know very well was called to a dead, dying church, Brother John. They've not baptized somebody in years. Let me say that again, in years. And there was an old fellow in that church that would come to church every Sunday. Folks got around the altar and prayed tonight. Every Sunday that guy would walk the halls of that church and he was praying for a miracle. Through all the deadness of the church, through all the dry years, he was praying for a miracle. And that young pastor came and the first week there, that young pastor led an 11-year-old boy to Christ. That little boy got saved. The pastor got ready to baptize him, Brother John, and when the pastor got ready to baptize him, he realized that the baptistry was full of rusty chairs and boxes, and Christmas decorations and stuff, not been used in years. They began to clean that baptistry out. They couldn't even find a drain plug. They had to buy one. They couldn't turn on the valve because it had rusted. They had to get a plumber out with a wrench to turn that valve, and water began to fill that baptistry. And that pastor said, when that water began to gurgle and fill that baptistry, that old fella that was there <laughs> that had been walking those halls praying for a miracle, fell on his knees and said, fill it up, Lord. Fill it up. I say that for somebody here tonight. Fill it up, Lord. Fill it up, Lord, because I need a miracle. Would you bow with me all over the building? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over the house. Every head is bowed, every eyes closed. Would you stand to your feet with those heads bowed and eyes closed? Brother Michael slipped into the piano. I remember when I was with you last year, I preached a sermon that I preached in my home church recently on Elisha and a woman that um, was a widow woman. I did something I did most of the year last year when God led me to preach that sermon. I invited folks to come to the altar. Brother John, I took the thrill, I'm not above your pastor or any other preacher here, to walk around the altar and just lay hands on folks and pray for them. And I want to do that tonight. Because there are some of you tonight that need a miracle. I'm not going to invade your space. I'm not going to get in your comfort zone. I'm going to invite every preacher in the building. Brother Darrell, I'm going to invite you, this pastor that's here tonight, Brother John, Brother Bill, every preacher that's here to join me. And we're just going to slip around this altar. And we're going to lay hands on folks. We're not going to invade your space. not going to ask you what your need is. Every church ought to have a service like this. Once in a while, somebody here needs a miracle. We're going to pray for a miracle tonight. Somebody here is in a hopeless situation. You need a miracle. While all that's going on, Brother John, I'm going to ask you not to join us in prayer for a moment. I want you to stay at the front because somebody here tonight needs to give something to Jesus. Somebody needs to give him. 
first of all, their heart because you're lost and you're going to die and go to hell. You need to give him your heart tonight. Somebody needs to give him your talent. God might be calling somebody to preach, or somebody to teach, or somebody to serve. God's calling somebody tonight to give something to the Lord. Don't insult God by telling him it's small. Let me tell you something. The important thing is not what you have in your basket. The important thing is that Jesus has your basket. So I'm inviting you to come. I'm inviting folks who want a miracle tonight, just want to pray. Some of you may not be able to kneel, just want to come. Let us pray for you. And some of you here tonight want to come to Brother John because you need to get saved. There's something you need to give to the Lord. Some of you need to give him your obedience. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to move your membership and join this church. Father, I confess before this crowd that I've preached this Bible a long time. And in studying this passage, God, I can't remember a time when a miracle has gotten so a hold of me as this miracle. One I've known since a little boy, how my Savior fed maybe 25,000 people with one little basket. And God, it wouldn't have mattered if there were 25 billion on that hill because he is God. Tonight we worship and praise you all over this building, members and visitors alike. There are folks that need a miracle, need a touch from the Lord. Somebody needs to get saved. Somebody needs the bread of life. God, would you move in this house right now and we'll praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed, every eye closed, Michael's beginning to play. Don't go home. Don't go home yet. We're going to be closing in a little while. Anybody want prayer tonight? If you want prayer, just come on. Just, stay, just begin to come. Whether you get on your knees or stand near the altar. Preachers, I want you to join us. Just come on. There's already folks kneeling. Every preacher in the house, come on and join us. We're praying for folks tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Others are coming. Brother John is going to stand right here because I believe somebody needs the greatest miracle of all. You need the bread of life tonight. So John's not going to stand here a long time. He's going to help us and minister and assist. Somebody tonight needs to give Jesus what's in your basket. So I'm going to ask you one more time, what's in your basket tonight? What's in your basket? And I'm inviting you to come.
in the right place for a miracle tonight. Anybody else? I'm assuming everybody that has come is a believer, and that's wonderful because that's revival. It's for the church. But I just wonder if there's somebody here that's hungry. Needs a bread of life. You say, Rick, there's a big crowd here. I don't want to step out in front of all those folks. I love you when I tell you this. One day you'll step out of the biggest crowd of all to stand before Jesus. And if you're lost, you'll be dismissed from his presence to eternal hell forever, forever. Tonight he's offering you eternal life. Anybody else? Fix turn over the man of God. Anybody else? What a work God has done tonight. Anybody else? What a work in the church God's done. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Pastor John. Please be seated. Just take your seat right where you're at. About 23 years ago, as a 17-year-old boy, I had a um, mentor of mine, Harry Reddick. Took me from a church there in Ocean Way out here for the first time, first time ever stepping foot in Black Rock as a 17-year-old boy. It took place 23 years ago. Miss Martha, where are you at? Miss Martha, she, she was driving the car, either driving the car that night or riding shot with my brother Harry. Brought me out here to hear Rick Corn preach. As a 17-year-old boy, I was blown away by the ministry, the preaching of Rick Corn. And um, from there on out, you know, I started following Rick Corn, getting his tapes, listening to him. And man, I, I want to be the next Rick Corn. As a 17 year old boy, I want to be the next Rick Corn. And here's what God showed me God showed me this. He did not call me to be Rick Corn, He called me to be John Casper. And so, listen, as Brother Rick was talking about the, the basket case, and listen, we all need to be a basket case believer. Just let us sink in a little bit. We need to be a basket case believer. And you're too, uh, too, uh, too often we get so caught up in looking at another, in Brother Bill's basket. I was looking at Brother Rick's baskets, basket, seeing what he had to offer. But no, God don't want to, he don't want us looking at other people's baskets. God wants you to take what you have 